In the Brazilian Matare Santa Genebra Nature Reserve near Campinas, most species of the Malpighia cee start flowering in February, including Stigmaphylon lalandianum, whose densely foliaged festoons are now covered with a profusion of light yellow flowers. This species belongs to the group of the oil flowers, a type of blossoms that have developed a most unusual and fascinating relationship with their pollinators. The flowers are completely devoid of nectar, but yet they are pollinated by bees that are attracted by a special fatty oil. The bees selectively search for this oil. Relatively few genera of bees share this peculiarity. They belong in part to the solitary Centridini, a tribe of the family Apidae. These oil-collecting bees vary considerably in their body size. The bumblebee-sized, somewhat ponderous species, as here Centris collaris, prefer to fly along the periphery of the liana curtain in their movement from flower to flower. However, the smaller species are much more versatile flyers and manage to reach even the flowers deeply hidden among the foliage by hectic flight maneuvers. At least eight different species exploit stigmaphylon's oil. This tireless collecting activity has a single purpose, to provide food for the bee's offspring. It does not serve as food for the adults themselves. Only the females care for the brood. Therefore, the females alone engage in gathering food for their larvae. The males merely play a role as sexual partners. During oil collecting, the animal's ventral thorax becomes dusted with pollen. This pollen adheres to the stigmas of other flowers during subsequent visits. The back of the flower bears the oval oil glands or aliophores, which are arranged in pairs as special appendages of the calyx segments. Four twin glands alternate with the petals, but the lowermost median pair is absent. In the course of evolution, the aliophores have most probably originated from extrafloral nectaries, which are still present on the green leaves of the plant. These glands are epithelial aliophores, that means that the oil is secreted by a palisade-like epidermis. This secretion lies concealed beneath a cuticular blister. Only after pressure has been exerted by a stroking bee leg does the cuticle burst at a preformed weak spot and an oil drop oozes out. A bee here, for example Centris collaris, is seen harvesting the oil with her fore and middle legs. The yield is transferred to the plumose trousers of the posterior legs and is finally unloaded into the brood cells as a larval food. These storage and transporting organs are called scopae. Fourfold slow motion allows observation of how a bee approaches a flower with her antennae stretched forward. Due to the bee's weight, the flower drops a considerable distance. The oil is removed from each twin gland by three scraping strokes of the legs on average. The bee alights and tightly grasps the claw of the vexillum with her mandibles. The collected oil initially remains in the densely pylose areas of the fore and middle legs. This scanning micrograph shows the foreleg of a centris species. The oil collectors are located on the metatarsus of the front and middle legs. From there, the collected oil seeps into the plumet fringe on the outer flank, visible above, where it is temporarily stored. A comb of elastic spatulate chitinic city comprises an oil scraper. 
three large broad setae are located opposite the comb. As seen here, these are absent from the middle legs. This bee performs a purely oil-collecting flight, as is indicated by her moist, darkly shiny scopae. The liquid is passed from the forelegs to the middle legs by squeezing it out between the bent legs and is finally pasted onto the inner flanks of the posterior legs. Here again, the oil is squeezed out and then backloaded onto the scopae of the hind legs. To keep her legs available for pollen transfer to the scopae, the bee hangs onto a leaf by clinging to it temporarily with her mandibles. Here an Epicharis female is grooming her body. Centris varia, the tiniest species observed. She performs especially hectic flight maneuvers. She also transfers the yield to her scope with similar skimming movements and occasionally spreads her hind legs upward. Centris varia prefers to visit the buds of the flowers, perhaps because the open flowers have already been emptied as a result of the strong competition by larger species. Because the vexillum is not yet available for clinging, she must use her posterior legs for support on landing. Since the petals do not yet obstruct our view, the scraping of the elyophores can easily be observed. These oil-collecting bees differ considerably in their choice of breeding sites. Some centrist species make use of tunnels burrowed by coleopteran larvae in old wooden posts. But most species dig their own burrows for rearing their larvae. About 110 miles west of Campinas, there is an experimental station of the University of Ribeirao Preto. Here, the breeding behavior of wood-nesting centrist species is investigated in detail. To this end, short pieces of hollow bamboo cane are offered to the bees as a nesting aid and are readily accepted by them. Here a Centris vitata female has chosen her breeding place. She constructs a series of brood cells in the tube by applying a mortar-like mass of oil and sand grains. An occupied piece of bamboo has been split lengthwise. This allows us to look at the nest. A layer of dried oil covers the outer wall that consists of stabilized sand. The wall's upper half has been removed cautiously to be able to look into the brood cells. In the youngest brood cell, a larva is floating in a nutrient paste of oil and pollen. The larvae of the following older cells are, with one exception, more mature. The original primary cell is located at the posterior end of the tube. Its larva will be the first to pupate. The cell's heterochronous establishment makes pupil stages of differing lengths necessary. Only in this way can the youngest individual in the foremost cell hatch first and to leave the nest through the entrance. At least five bee species exploit Angelonia hirta and pollinate it in the process. They are solitary and all of them belong to the Centridini, a tribe of the family Apide. Their body size varies considerably. Here, for instance, the bumblebee-sized, somewhat clumsy Centris obsoleta of the subgenus Melacentris. Only the females collect oil because they alone take care of the brood. 
The orange patch on the bee's back is due to the pollen of a nectariferous passion flower she visited some time before. In flight, the collected oil is passed to the densely plumose shanks of the hind legs. Here an individual of Centris fuscata of the subgenus Trachina with chestnut brown abdomen and eyes. The middle legs also perform collecting movements outside the pouches but they do so in vain as only two aliophores are present. Between 10 and 100 flowers must be visited to fill the scope completely. Then the bee returns to her nest where the oil load will be stripped off the scope into the brood cells. The foraging flights last from 7 o'clock in the morning until late afternoon. Intermittently, oil and pollen foraging sessions are briefly interrupted by feeding flights, during which the bees take nectar to renew their own energy supply. The yellow loose strife, which belongs to the primrose family, produces a fatty oil in its flowers that is used by the bee to feed its young. Since, in this case, fatty oil is offered as a reward, the blossoms of the loose strife, Lucimachia vulgaris, have been assigned to the group of the so-called oil flowers. They lack true nectar. Lucimachia frequently forms thick stands by means of stolons. These are visited by their pollinating agent, the hairy-legged mining bee Macropis labiata. Open blossoms are distributed over space and time. This results in a continuous blooming period that lasts for several weeks. From end of June until August, the females of Macropis labiata are busy collecting oil and pollen on sunny days. They do this exclusively on Lucimachia. The collected oil-pollen mixture is very rich in calories. However, it does not serve as food for the adults, but is only destined to nourish the young that are reared in the subterranean brood cells. The female collects the oil with her legs. To this purpose she dabs and brushes over an oil-secreting zone in the center of the flower. In the process, the animal's underside is copiously dusted with pollen. Thus, pollen collection is rather a side effect of the active oil-collecting behavior. The tarsal limbs of the fore and middle legs are furnished with rubbing surfaces, which are composed of antler-shaped absorptive seti. These initially take up the oil by capillary action. At the end of a collecting flight, a bee's full burden weighs about 10 mg. Seven of such flights on average are necessary to produce a loaf for a single larva. This amount constitutes about a day's work of a single bee. The females construct their nest in the soil usually not far from the oil host plants. The entrance is hidden. A small heap of excavated soil marks it. From the entrance a ramified tunnel system leads downward and each of its branches ends in one brood cell. These bees are solitary but they often nest gregariously. Fertilized Macropis females usually spend the night near the brood cells in the nest. But virgin females and the males normally remain in the blossoms of Lucimachia overnight. Compared to the common floral rewards, nectar and pollen, the production of oil is relatively rare. It occurs independently in members of a number of non-related families. Most of what we know about this oil-based plant-bee relationship was learned in the southern hemisphere. Oil flowers have been described from a number of plant families there. The interdependence of Lucimachia and Macropis is the only one of its kind known from Europe. It proves that such a pollination strategy may also occur in our latitudes. 
The obligate mutual dependence of these partners in pollination results in the circumstance that their joint survival will only be guaranteed where the requisite ecological conditions are favorable to both the bee and its host plant. If only one of these two partners is missing, the survival of the other is no longer certain.